we must have multiple effective treatments, even if those treatments have modest benefits. So the people living with ALS today can hold on until we find cures. As Scott said, we've had this conversation with the FDA before, and we should not have to keep having the same conversation. We should not have to ask people with ALS to come back year after year to speak to the risks they are willing to take. It's unfair and it's really unjust. Let me be clear. It is for the people living with ALS to determine the risks they're willing to take and the value they see in the benefits, not anyone else. Hello and welcome to another episode of Connecting ALS. I am your host, Jeremy Holden, joined this week by my good friend and colleague, Jessica Chapman. Jessica, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jeremy. It's really great to be here with you today. Yeah, excited to have you as we move into the next phase of Connecting ALS. We're excited to bring some new voices into the conversation. Couldn't think of a better person to have on this week. As we look back on the We Can't Wait action meeting, earlier this week, Jessica, you and I had the opportunity to listen in as representatives of the ALS community had an opportunity to bring their case to the FDA and call for a little bit more urgency and flexibility in their approach to uh, making promising treatments available to people with ALS. Yesterday was incredibly powerful. We heard from eight different voices of people who are living with ALS, and I know it was just the beginning. Yeah, and you know, there's some evidence that the folks from the FDA heard what people with ALS were saying. A little note of hope coming out of that, but really a sense of frustration was heard as well from some of the speakers calling back to previous hearings in 2013 and 2018 and some frustrations that the same conversation is had every couple of years and it's time for action. So we had the opportunity to sit down with Larry Falavina, a member of the ALS Association's National Board of Trustees, and one of the speakers who was there to capture his reflections on what we heard yesterday and where we go from here. So why don't we step out of the way and hear from Larry Falavina. Larry, thanks for being with us today. Good to be here. Your testimony yesterday was very powerful, and we will uh, certainly link to the full testimony, uh, the full hearing, so people can check that out in the show notes. But just want to get your initial takeaway to how that hour went and um, you know your experience uh, preparing and, and just kind of how the day went for you. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that the FDA and uh, pharma was willing to take the time to hear patients' voices, uh, people with ALS. I think it's great for us to connect with both the FDA and the pharma so that they know this isn't just statistics. It's not just a study. It's not just data. There are people behind all of that. And of course, I think what all of us want is action out of this, some change. Uh, It was mentioned several times yesterday that we've had these discussions before. Um, These are not new issues. And I think what will make yesterday really successful is if we see change come out of it. Uh, In terms of preparation, there really wasn't any. It was just me telling my story, my experience uh, facing ALS. Yeah, you talked about, Larry, how we heard several references to the number of hearings in the past. Sandy Morris comes to mind as someone who very passionately and eloquently talked about 2013, 2018, 2021, having the same conversations as you said. People living with ALS want to live. Plain and simple. We want to live. I reread the 2013 FDA hearing transcripts. Put tears in my eyes. Absolutely nothing has changed. You have not changed. ALS has not changed. The only thing that has changed are the faces of people with ALS. The speakers with ALS are gone. They died waiting. I watched the 2018 meeting with great enthusiasm. My friend Corey created a survey taken by 600 people with ALS that quantitatively showed that we absolutely want to be able to access investigational therapies and that we have a sky-high acceptance of the risk-benefit due to the atrocity of this disease to no avail. 
Corey died waiting, along with so many of my friends. I am here today to say that I am dying waiting. Please hear me this time. I am standing on the shoulders of giants to say, please hear me. Please hear us and act now. It's not within my power to save my life. It's within yours. Please hear us and act now when we tell you again that we gratefully accept the risks and side effects that being able to take investigational therapies that could prolong our lives. Please hear us and act now when I remind you that the biggest risk has already happened to us the day of our diagnosis. Living with ALS is as risky as it gets. How, how did her comments uh, resonate with you? I think they were spot on. You know, I have been blessed with more time with this disease for whatever reason, it's progressing slower with me. Uh, Sandy, unfortunately, is a lot farther along in her progression. And, you know, she doesn't have time to waste. I mean, none of us with this disease do. But, you know, I think the thing that I hope really struck the audience was, was her comment about, it's easier for me to plan my death than it is to get a treatment for this disease. And, you know, that, that's a reality. You know, people facing this disease don't have many options. So uh, I think that, that, that struck me and I hope it, it struck the audience as well. But I, I'm glad she was direct. I'm glad that she, um, you know, she wasn't pulling any punches. This is the reality of the disease. And letting people know that they have the ability to change the course of the life of people dealing with ALS, right? I mean, they're, they're, her life, other people's lives are literally in their hands. Reminded me, Troy Fields eloquently laid out how the way the ALS community balances risk versus reward relative to the decision makers at the FDA as saying there's no such thing as a modest gain in life expectancy. As I consider what is to come in my ALS journey, I hope for one of two things, that I get a reprieve from this death sentence through a cure. And if that's not possible, that at least it slows down its progression through effective treatments to buy me more time, maybe enough time for another life extending or even life saving treatment to become available. When you're given three to five years to live, even a few months makes an enormous difference. For me, this could mean walking my daughter down the aisle in her wedding or witnessing my grandson's birth or another Christmas with the family. After all, who among us who has not lost a loved one does not wish they could have just another day with them? For me and the hundreds of people, thousands of people living with ALS, along with their loved ones, the threshold of risk and the definition of benefits is significantly different from those of you making the determination to approve treatments. Because unless it is your own life on the line, you simply do not get it. To be clear, the difference is not recklessness, for we do not want to trade one premature death for another, although most of us would take that chance if there was a probability that we can beat this. But we are willing to take more chances to extend life than our healthier counterparts. We have everything to gain. For us, there is no such thing as a modest gain in life expectancy that would eliminate a potential treatment from consideration. Any additional gain in life expectancy is welcome. ALS takes away so much from us. It took away my ability to play cash with my grandchildren and hugging my loved ones, and I was a hugger. It is taking away my chance of living a life most people take for granted. The risks and benefits of ALS treatments are perceived differently for those in the fight than for those in the sidelines. 
and the urgency is far greater. After all, it is our lives on the line. Uh, again, I think he was, you know, spot on with his comments. As I said as well, when you're dealing with a disease that takes away your ability to speak and eat and move, and you know that the end result is that you're going to die, you know, what side effect is going to scare you, really? I mean, it's, it's if you have an opportunity, even a small one, to delay what right now is inevitable, which is ALS taking your life, then for me, that's kind of a no brainer. I'm going to take that opportunity. And I think that's the case, you know, I don't want to speak for the entire ALS population, but I would think pretty much everyone would be willing to take that opportunity. You know, every decision we make every day is a risk reward decision, driving to work, you know, <laughs> going swimming in the ocean, going skiing, whatever it is, right? So people need to make a decision for themselves about is the risk worth the reward? And when you're talking about potential treatments for a disease like ALS, the downside risk is very small compared to the upside reward of living a longer life. Yeah, a theme that was running through so many of the comments that we heard yesterday. And Larry, just pivoting off that, you talked in, in your comments about the, the risk that is taken on by participants in clinical trials and drawing a parallel between that and the, the risk that you and, and others with ALS have, have spoken about being willing to take on. Talk to us a little bit about that, that point that you were trying to make there. Well, uh, again, for me, I'm in a clinical trial, right? I'm taking a drug that is experimental, right? Um, it hasn't been fully vetted. It, it hasn't been approved, but it has shown to be safe and it has shown to be effective. And I think once you get to that point in a drug trial, you know, once a drug has shown that it has some efficacy, it's more than likely also shown itself to be safe, or at least you know, have some idea what the potential uh, risks of side effects could be. And I think as long as a patient is given that information, right, they should be able to decide for themselves. And, and that was a theme that came out during the call yesterday as well. Yeah. A person with ALS, with the help and advice of their medical team, their own personal medical team should be able to make the decision about what level of risk they're willing to take and not have that decision made for them. Larry, another theme that was prominent in so many of the speeches was just talking about some of those moments that you get with that, as Troy Fields called it, there's no such thing as an insignificant or a moderate extension, right? And, and he talked about being a hugger and, you know, you know, and how ALS has taken away his ability to hug. You talked about, you know, uh, playing soccer with your boys, going mountain biking with your wife. Talk to us about how the, discussing those moments, those things that... I almost certainly from day to day take for granted. How do you feel that's going to resonate with the decision makers that you were talking to yesterday? Well, I, I think you alluded to that, right? Is that for the most part, myself included, before my diagnosis, we take things like that for granted. We take our health in general, maybe for granted, right? Until something happens, you just figure my body's going to be fine, right? And I can continue to do all these things. And so, I think when you put it in terms like that and people begin to internalize the fact that, wow, I'm a runner, for example, what happens, you know, tomorrow if I get up and I can no longer run or, you know, you have a big family and you spend a lot of time together going on vacations, you know, getting together for barbecues, whatever it is. And, you know, that is suddenly taken away from you. Right. Um, so losing the ability to speak, for example, you know, if you're a big relationship person, how do you maintain those relationships? And so I think examples like that just help people to internalize how devastating this disease really is, um, what it takes away from you, and that people are willing to do, you know, whatever, <laughs> to delay losing those things. They just become more precious. And, you know, that was one of the things that I try to relate 
when telling the stories of, of anyone who's fighting this disease, right, is that we, we can't take those kind of things for granted. Larry, from your perspective, do you feel like the FDA is actually going to now do something with those remarks that they heard? Well, I certainly hope that they will. I expect that they will. Hearing those voices and those stories yesterday, if they relate at all to the experience of what people are going through who are facing this disease, I can't see how they wouldn't make changes. You know, we have the Act for ALS, you know, that's now going into Congress, which will hopefully open some more doors. But the reality is there are some pathways already available to make treatments available sooner, to make treatments available under compassionate use. You know, I I think coming out of that meeting, I would hope that they explore ways to use things that are already available while we're waiting for more doors open. So there's the optimist side of me that says, yes, they will do something. I think the bigger question is, how quickly will they do something, right? I mean, we're talking about um, a government agency. Uh, There's a lot of rules. There's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of moving parts. You know, how quickly can you turn a ship that big? I think that's the bigger question for me is that not will they do something, but how quickly will they do it? Yeah, and one of the comments that really resonated with me yesterday came from uh, Carrie Meistrick, who talked about having just received a COVID vaccine and asking for a similar sense of urgency in terms of making experimental drugs or, or drugs that show, treatments that show promise available to uh, people with ALS. During these 23 years, I have watched hundreds of friends die from this awful disease. It is so discouraging to know the time and money it takes to get one drug for pre-clinical development to FDA approval. Time most of us don't have. My time will run out too, just like every other ALS patient. I want to see all my kids graduate college and get married, and I want the chance to enjoy grandchildren with my husband. I need access to promising treatments to make this possible. I recently had a vaccine that was not approved by the FDA to prevent a virus I might get when I jump at the chance Try a drug that might help me live longer from a disease that I am dying from if it has already proven to be safe and well tolerated, but isn't approved yet. Absolutely. Please. Give me that chance. Larry, you drew on a different historical analogy to remind FDA that it has this authority, that it has a history of, of acting quickly. Talk to us a little bit about you know, the, the analogy you drew with the response to the AIDS epidemic in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, you know, I, I tried to use that as an example of when the FDA did move quickly, when they pulled off the restraints, you know, when they made that drug available, despite the fact that there were pretty some significant side effects. Now, granted, in the case of COVID and in the case of, of AIDS, right, we're talking about viruses that were affecting eventually millions of people. 
However, when AZT was approved uh, in 1987, there were less than 35,000 cases of AIDS in the United States. So the ugly truth, unfortunately, is that ALS does not affect millions of people. It affects tens of thousands. You know, of course, that shouldn't matter, right? A life is a life. And anything that you can do to save someone's life or prolong someone's life needs to be done. But I don't think, you know, we wouldn't be realistic if we didn't say things will move faster when it's affecting millions of people, not tens of thousands of people. And, and again, that's the ugly truth, but it's also a reality. So how do we get people to realize that we're capable of doing this? We're able to do this. We should do this, despite the fact that it's a smaller population of people who are affected. And, uh, you know, Jessica alluded to Dr. Cavazzoni's uh, comments earlier, but one of the things that struck me is she said that uh, the agency and industry need to step up as much as the ALS community has. Clearly, uh, there is no doubt in our mind and in my mind that the, the path through to finding a cure for ALS is in uh, taking incremental steps and in, make, and in making drugs available that um, lead to incremental improvement. We have a, um, a success history from, the, uh, uh, from cancer, and we have seen that over the past 10, 20 years, uh, the path towards finding a cure for cancer has all been about uh, developing drugs and making drugs available that lead to uh, incremental improvement. You know, for that to happen, there has to be a very strong partnership between people living with ALS, their um, caregivers, FDA, and, and drug developers. And, and clearly, uh, today's uh, session is uh, a testimonial, testimonial of the fact that the people living with ALS and, and their caregivers are clearly going above and beyond when it comes to doing their part. And so I agree that FDA and drug developers um, have a big role to play and, and need to do their part. So perhaps a, a glimmer of hope in there. Larry, those are all the questions that we had for you. Did you have any other closing thoughts? Well, I, I do want to go back to the comment that, that you just made and that Jessica made earlier about hope, right? And how powerful hope is even in the course of fighting a disease. Right. So knowing that there's an opportunity for you to fight back, knowing that you have a chance to perhaps slow this disease is incredibly powerful. Um, and that's honestly one of the things that I appreciate about the ALS Association's goal of making ALS a livable disease while we continue to search for that final cure or cures. Right. Buying people more time gives them not only gives them more life, more opportunity to experience uh, their relationships and, and just living a longer life, but it gives them hope that while they have more time, maybe we get that, you know, holy grail of a cure. A nice note of hope to end things on, Larry. Thanks again for your time this week. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Larry. There is a lot of reason to be hopeful, but there's also a lot of work that we need to do. And again, this is just the first step. Yeah, the ALS Association's work to uh, compel the FDA to act does not end with the event from earlier this week. You can go over to the ALS Association's blog post, uh, which we will share in the show notes. But the association will be asking FDA to recommit to its 2019 ALS trial guidance explain how it's implemented it and how it plans to get even better. We will be asking for a detailed report on these issues with a deadline. In addition, Jessica, big news this week, the Act for ALS bill was reintroduced. The ALS Association will also be supporting the Promising Pathways Act. And in our appropriations request to Congress, we're asking for $50 million for the FDA to fund research on treatment and regulatory issues to benefit people with ALS. So a lot of work to be done, as you said. That's going to do it for this week's episode. Thanks again to Larry Falavina and my co-host Jessica Chapman. You can subscribe to Connecting ALS wherever you find podcasts. Please find time to like, rate, and review us. It is a great way for us to connect with even more people. 
This week's episode was produced by Garrett Tiedemann of the ALS Association's Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapter. Thanks for listening. We'll connect with you again soon.